Focusing the mind. Um, you know, we take in information, right, all the time. We make decisions about the things that we do, the things that we consume, the things that we think about. And that's based on a, mon a bunch of different elements uh, comprised of this thing called our psyche. And what is a psyche, you may ask? Well, psyche is a term used to describe the different elements of a personality, essentially, or a person's being. Someone might describe it as the mind or even the soul of a human. The term psyche comes from the ancient Greek pagan goddess uh, of the same name, Psyche. Uh, and she was born immortal, but she became a good... This is not true, right? This is... This is false, but <laughs> just making sure. I just want everybody to know, you know, not real um, mythology. She became a, a goddess through a series of trials, uh, kind of like Hercules. You know, Hercules had labors. Well, she had labors too, except it was like combing through through wheat or something. There was like they're just like extremely tedious, horrible things. I don't remember all of them, but anyway. Um, she found her joy, though, after overcoming all these great amounts of suffering that she had to endure. And so for this reason, she was elevated to a goddess of souls. And Greeks believed in order to find your true happiness that you had to endure great suffering and tribulation, right? That's why in Greek theater, they have the comedy and the tragedy, right? They invented that that whole um, genre of entertainment. And you know, in some ways that is true. You gain an appreciation for things when you have to work for them or when they don't come to you cheaply. Um, the work, even if it's rewarding work, calls on us to sometimes to suffer and make sacrifices. And our modern understanding of this term psyche is, is a... I guess a complex psychological term, and you can check like every um, every web. You know, there's a million websites that'll tell you a bunch of different things about it. Uh, Sigmund Freud, of whom I would not necessarily ascribe too much um, truth or accuracy to, but he came up with this idea of the id, the ego, and the super ego. And basically, the id is the carnal or basal desires. You know, these are things that are that are true. Uh, the superego is an altruistic, ultimate moral goodness about a person. And the ego is kind of like a compromise between the two of those things. Um, and I, I saw a good example recently that kind of makes it more understandable. The, if your mother gives you a, a piece of candy, the id in you would consume it immediately. Your superego would give it to your brother knowing that he loves candy and um, you don't want to be greedy, and your ego would divide the candy in half. <laughs> so there, that's, the, uh, that's, that's basically how um, you can maybe understand those things. Of course, the Christian ever strives not for the compromise or the ego, but for the greatest good, that which is called a superego. To give of the self without expecting things in return. To think of others even better than ourselves, meaning that we default to a standard of selfless giving rather than being a greedy taker or even that of a compromiser, right? Uh, and, and that's scriptural, right? If you take a look at Philippians 2, 3 through 8, it says, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, for a Christian, striving for what is true altruism, 
striving and trying to do the very best with our lives to serve God, that is the goal. Love, sacrifice, and humility are the virtues that we're called to emulate and they're the, that we see in Jesus Christ. And how does that relate to our psyche and how that works? What goes into the mix for how we determine how to make the most altruistic decision in a given situation? Well, I want to kind of expound on that. Because I think that we consciously understand, at least on some level, how our mind works. But to understand what's going on in there, maybe in terms, we can maybe make better decisions when we feel ourselves going off, the, going off down the wrong path, right? If we're succumbing to something that is, um, th- that's basically wrong or evil. And sometimes knowing why you're struggling, knowing where your problem is, it's easier to fix it, right? Uh, and the Bible tells us lots of places on how to fix lots of things that are wrong with our mind, but sometimes we don't really think about it uh, in the moment. But there are a few different things that happen when we make a calculated decision with our mind, and they are from our place of reason, our conscience, not that we're <laughs> awake, but, you know, Jiminy Cricket, you know, our conscience, our self-control, and our emotional response, right? So we have reason, conscience, self-control, and emotions, I'm going to talk briefly about these different things so that we have a greater means of control when we make a decision and that we make the right decision, the decision that is honorable and just and good. And I'm going to start out with reason. Reason is based on facts and knowledge. Those facts can be of a physical nature, like science or I guess you could say mathematics, but they can also be of an intangible truth, like philosophy and logic. And a lot of things, you know, wisdom of the Bible is reason. The book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, that Josh is actually teaching from on Wednesday nights, uh, primarily is a book of reason. Its goal is to present a case that a reasonable person will read it and be convinced in their own mind that God exists and that Christianity is true. Right? That's the, the aim, and it aims to reason with people through facts and logic and philosophy in order to make a case that it's accurate. Um, the Bible is also a book of wisdom and reason and exists to convert people of a reasonable mind. God, through the prophets and the authors of the Bible, uses reason with people in order to convince them to change their mind or to repent to change their ways. We can take a look at one example where God tells somebody to reason within themselves here. It says in Isaiah 1, 16 through 20, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, stop doing evil. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, obtain justice for the orphan, and plead for the widow's case. Come now and let us debate your case. Debate your case is also in a lot of other translations says, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall become white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall, shall be like wool. And if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and you rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right. So you're given some information and some things to reason in your mind about what you're going to do and how you're going to live your life. Right. In this passage, God is giving a directive or an ultimatum saying to a person to stop with their evil ways and to do good instead. God invites the person to come and even debate with him or reason with him, uh, as some translations say, about the fate that lies in store for those that are evil and wicked or hateful and disobedient. God's making an offer for forgiveness 
contingent upon a person's contrition and repentance, right? The person who repents and lives a righteous and just life will live a life that is rewarded by God, whereas a person who chooses not to doesn't. <laughs> um, it says you'll be devoured by the sword, specifically. The person then is left with the task to, of reasoning within themselves and weighing in the balance what it is that they want to do with their life. They must decide if they're going to go on and continue to be evil or if they're going to repent. Reason is all over the Bible. Prophecies that come true about the coming of Jesus Christ, people's testimony of seeing the risen Christ, and people's testimony of miracles are all reasons why a person should believe in God and believe in Jesus. In fact, the Gospel of John makes the very case that all the good works and the miraculous events that are recorded in the Gospel are written for the very purpose as to convince people um, to be reasonable and accept the truth. Right? The next thing I want to talk about is our conscience. This is often <laughs> depicted as Jiminy Cricket to Pinocchio or the angel that sits on your shoulder, even though that's not what it is. It's not an angel. You don't have a little cherub hanging out with you. But it's that inner voice that convicts and convinces us to be moral and to be just. And Paul calls it the law that's written on the heart. And that's from Romans 2, 14 and 15, where he says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having a law are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. We all have that, right? Everybody's got it. That little voice in the back of your head says, you shouldn't do that. You know better, right? And some of us have beaten that guy up senseless and tied him up and locked him in a closet. And, you know, we're probably not super, super good folks if we're, if we're that person, right? But we all have that guy in the back of our head telling us what we ought to do. Consequently, you know, what I think is kind of interesting is... Uh, I don't see how that works into evolution. Have you ever thought about that? Where does a conscience fit in with evolution? When does it ever benefit a person to be virtuous um, and not act in their own self-interest or out of fear? You know, No other animal is naturally compelled to be good and righteous for the sake of virtue itself. That we're the only, only thing that lives and breathes on this earth that does that. No other living thing struggles with anything like morality. You can impose that, impose morality on your dog, you know, but they're not being moral. You're anthropomorphizing your dog, right? They're just doing what they do in a wolf pack. They don't think about anything altruistic. They're just obeying you out of fear, realistically. Fear and respect, right? <laughs> so knowing that, though, the humans are unique and special, almost as if they were created that way, right? Uh, almost as if they were made in the image of a higher and perfect being, right? It's, it's evidence for God, isn't it? The fact that we have that little voice in us, in the back of our head, and we, everybody knows it, and it's even scientifically proven that people just have this thing. It's kind of cool. But anyway, we have a conscience, right? And that is another element of how we make decisions. Um, so we reason with facts and logic, and we wrestle with our morality. And those two things come down through a very important funnel. Like, a, <laughs> there's a toll booth there, and that toll booth is called willpower. Uh, or as the Bible calls it, self-control. Uh, self-control is our ability to listen to that little voice and to reject our basic and animalistic and selfish desires. To reject things like greed and lust and fear and overcome them through altruism. Self-control is, uh, is a necessary virtue 
as it is a vital component in a person's growth as a Christian, right? You can't be a Christian without self-control. You can't consistently obey and follow God's commandments for your life if you don't have self-control. Self-control is how we keep our desires in check and give our conscience time to work on our mind and overcome our base desires and come to a better result. It holds that bad stuff at bay, right? Um, I think the Apostle Peter put it pretty good when he said this, uh, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, what does it do for you? Perseverance, willpower, right? And in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. It is like the linchpin holding things all together. See, self-control enables perseverance or stick to And without self-control, people give up on what they should do and they fall back into their sin. They're overcome by their desires and instead of being able to stand up to them and resist them. Self-control is looking at a brownie that you really want and having the inner fortitude to walk away from it. And self-control pr produces that perseverance that allows you to come back to that brownie the next day and, and walk away from it a little bit easier that time until you just don't even notice the brownie anymore. Until it no longer has any power over you. Now turn the brownie to whatever sin you're dealing with right now. And that's what self-control helps you deal with. And that brings us finally to the, uh, the wild card in all of this, and that is emotions, right? Yeah, everybody has a lot of different feelings about emotions. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, but they are powerful, right? Emotions are powerful, and they're also unpredictable. Um, all of our emotions respond differently to struggles that we're going through or st different stresses. Our emotions can be a lot of motivation to do good and to do the right thing. And if we train our emotions in righteousness, they can aid us and enable us to have passion about things that are good, about the things of God. And some of the most powerful verses in the Bible are an expression of emotion and connection that we have as a human person to what we're reading. You know, one of the shortest verses of the Bible tells us so much because of the emotion, right? John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Um, you know, before Jesus raised Lazarus from death, he was among all those who were grieved and suffering the loss of this man. Jesus felt their pain and their suffering within himself, and it was out of all that despair all around him that he wept, and he spoke the words, Lazarus, come forth. The tears of sadness turned to tears of joy. Despair transformed into elation and thankfulness. So that's, that's a big swing of emotions. You just thought somebody had, was gone. They died. And people were crying at the loss. And there he is coming out of the tomb. Unbind him, he said, right? Emotions can be extremely powerful tools for good. But at the same time, they can be very powerful tools for evil. That is why the reason and the conscience and the self-control are so very vitally important. Unbridled and undisciplined minds are evilly, easily influenced. Evilly influenced? I guess that would work too. Um, to, to, to do bad things, right? Think about the rage of Cain or the unbridled lust of David. Right? These are powerful, emotional beings that are unchecked, unbridled, undisciplined in their mind. And we can discipline our minds and our emotions so that we embrace what is good no matter what's going on around us, no matter what kind of stress is around us. And the conclusion is that we can understand how our mind works and we can have control over the choices that we make. When we feel ourselves getting anxious or fearful, when we have urges that, and desires that are dark and wicked, we can overcome them. 
God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can stand. It says in 1 Corinthians 10.13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful. who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. That escape is made much more accessible and a lot easier if we learn to master our mind and our body, and especially our emotions. So let us be honest with ourselves and reason rightly. Let us listen to our conscience and let it be our guide. Let us have self-control and let us use our emotional energies to accomplish good and wonderful things for the kingdom of God. At this time, I will offer an invitation if anybody wants to come forward for whatever reason, or if you want to give your life to Jesus today. If you believe in Him with all your heart, mind, and soul, if you um, are willing to repent of your sins and be baptized in commitment to Him, then you can receive forgiveness, and you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. And if that's something that you want to do this evening, I want to encourage you to come down as we sing, Tomorrow Might Be Too Late. There's a fountain.